Hi there. Um, my name is Maureen De Silva, and I am an artist associated with the Arts Tobacco who invited me to do a virtual tour. So I'm saying hello um, and seeing a few people join us. So while people are joining us, I think I'm just going to make a quick pinned comment so you can find um, my socials if you are interested in learning more about my space afterwards. So pardon me, I'm just on my iPad. And... Okay, and um, I have a few different sites, and I'm going to talk about my space um, and how I have been making art during COVID. So feel free to ask questions. And I'm just going to pin this. Okay, so hello everybody. It's so nice to see everybody here. Um, so just to reiterate, especially if you've just joined, my name is Maureen De Silva, and I am associated with Arts Tobacco as an arts educator and teacher, and I have taught in the past classes to adults and children, and I will be um, at Wincock Park this week in uh, a few following weeks. Um, and I'm here today to show you my space. So I wanna actually um, take this back a little bit. Um, I'm not actually at home. When the lockdown first happened, I did not come to my studio proper for a while. Um, and it was really sort of a difficult thing for me because I'm a printmaker. Um, so it was really hard to, to wrap my head around how was I going to do this at home. So um, I'm not doing this from home because my partner also works from home. Um, and even then I didn't really have a very, um, like a very good setup. I was just so used to having my space here. So um, often I would just be maybe in like the corner of my living room, maybe working on some embroidery or in the corner of another bedroom. I was just like finding spaces wherever I could to make something reasonable. And I was able to do a few non-toxic printmaking practices at home. But as we started to settle into life with COVID, um, I've returned to my studio. And so I'm actually coming to you live from the Inprint Collective Studio. So Inprint is a nonprofit arts organization that I founded in 2008 with a few of my colleagues, and we've had a few lineup changes since. But uh, we're basically dedicated to the love of printmaking. And for our first 10 years, we absolutely found ways to work in different spaces and came up with lots of different community projects. And we were actually working um, out of my home for a little while and I was collecting presses over the years and then we got to 2018 and we were celebrating our 10th anniversary and I was just collecting so many um, different art supplies and I was running out of space and we just decided to um, finally do it. We got a space. So we are currently located at Lansdowne and Bloor. I often say the Bloordale neighborhood but we're actually sort of in this weird no man's land where um, uh, no BIA seems to claim us, so I usually say Bloordale because that's the closest to us. We're very close to Lansdowne and Bloor, um, and we picked a really great location, I think, because we're right down the street um, from Mercer Union and other galleries that have opened up, including Mocha and Patel Brown, so we're, we feel like we're in a very exciting space, and I can't wait to show it to you. So I'm just going to answer some questions first. So, um, I've answered how long I've been affiliated with Arts Tobacco. I am also now um, going to answer what's something that people don't know about me. Um, so, I've been an arts educator now since at least 2012, and I work across uh, various different groups doing it. And probably most people would be shocked to find out that I didn't think I was going to like being an art teacher. I really thought that it was not for me, that I didn't think I had the patience um, or the skill set to share. Uh, I was a babysitter when I was younger and I didn't really think that I was that good at it back then, even though I do enjoy um, hanging out with kids. Um, so I just didn't think it was a path for me. And then one day I just got a job at a gallery uh, giving tours 
And I was really nervous doing that for a long time until I finally found my groove. And the thing that really made me fall in love with teaching art was having access to different art teachers to tell me how they expressed their love of art, learning different pedagogies in which to teach people, and then just having the satisfaction of learning with other people. So that's something that people probably would be surprised because so much of my practice is in based in teaching art. And I, I love to teach about printmaking in particular, as you'll see. So what do I do with my spare time when I'm not making art? So this is a really interesting question because I would say before COVID, I had no spare time. I was just jumping from gig to gig to gig and I had a few jobs that were not art related just to help pay the bills. Um, but since COVID has sort of enforced a lot of spare time, something that I've discovered that I uh, enjoy doing is spending time in my garden. I'm not good at gardening, um, especially prior to COVID. I could not keep an indoor plant alive. Um, succulents have died in my care. But um, I started a garden in my backyard. And even though it's not a pretty garden and it didn't grow the most fruit and vegetables, it was actually a really um, awesome thing to be able to do. And that's something that I hope that I can keep up with as we move forward. Um... What's your go-to meal for guests? Along with my inability to keep plants alive, I'm also not a great cook. <laughs> um, so usually if I um, invite people over, I might actually make sangria or um, a few things that I can make. I'm, I'm fine with appetizers. I can make a nice little uh, salmon and cream cheese tostada for you if you like, or I would do like a veggie quinoa salad type of thing. Um, otherwise, I might actually just order out to feed you, but definitely if I invite you to my house, I'll, I'll, I'll definitely offer you a snack. What is the most meaningful art experience you've had? That's a pretty big question. Um, you know, I can't think of just one thing, but I think when I, when I look back on, on this question, I think my answer might have to do with forming community with people through art and I've done that in many different ways. So um, for me, the most meaningful thing is when I'm often with somebody who says that they, uh, you know, they don't get art or they feel like an art space isn't for them because they're not part of that community. And we can have a conversation about what we're looking at or maybe I'm even teaching them a technique and they felt like they weren't artists. And to see that validation in their face is like, oh, actually this is for me. This is something that I can enjoy. Um, this is something I can understand. That's probably the most meaningful experience for me is, is art as a connector. So why do you think um, community arts are important? Um, I think if you're familiar with printmakers in general and if you look up various print collectives uh, around the world, one thing that is really interesting that will show up most times, like why do printmakers get together? Printmakers inherently need community in part because some of the equipment, which you'll see today, is really difficult and expensive to own by yourself. So for example, InPrint got together uh, because we were finishing art school um, back in 2008-2009 and we were just so sad at the thought of a not having access to the wonderful studio spaces at York but also not being able to make art together because we found it so necessary to help work through ideas to help troubleshoot technical issues and just to support each other so imprint literally formed to maintain that community and have found it necessary for our own artistic practices because I think it can be isolating as an artist if you're just constantly working by yourself. And there's definitely need for that space. Definitely I have moments where like, I just need to concentrate on this thing and I can't talk to anybody. But it's actually also very magical to have somebody in the studio with you sharing in your process um, and also helps with the expenses for sure. So, I mean, community arts are important is because that's how we live, I think. That's how we share art, and that's what, um, that's how we build community in the first place, at least for me. 
um, is really important. I think we can do a lot with it. I think sometimes community arts doesn't get seen as this, on the same level as fine arts, fine arts, but I think that's more, that that's a line that should be definitely non-existent because community arts really do the work of connecting people through arts. If you see arts as a catalyst for change, then you need that community art connection. So I think those are the questions so far. Feel free to ask me questions as we go through. And I'm gonna talk again a little bit about InPrint. Um, so InPrint is currently made up of five members and we share the rent of the space, but we are a registered nonprofit. And we currently are able to mostly host silkscreen and some hand pressed relief practices. We have cyanotypes happening in the space and we are also working towards um, building up our lithography capabilities. So I'm gonna start to show you around. So I hope you guys are excited for that. I'm gonna flip the camera if I'm able to, maybe it's this. Sorry, everyone just got a big close up of my hand. Behind me actually is our exhibition wall. So we do have a big enough space that we can host exhibitions. Um, if you're looking really closely, you might see that there are some pinholes in there and it's just simply because we haven't um, hosted a proper exhibition right now. We're just using it to throw up work to help keep us motivated. So I'm going to see if I can flip this around. Yeah, there we go. I'm so excited to show you the space. So this is our exhibition wall and I just want to do a quick pan so you can sort of get a sense of the wonderful natural light that we've gotten here. And if you are familiar with InPrint and you were in this space prior to COVID, you might notice that we actually did quite a bit of changing around in this space. So I'm gonna start with this wall here and showcase some of our work. Most of the work that you see here, a few piece of these pieces are for sale, but others are just fun experiments or cast offs. So we just threw them up there. I wanna just to quickly highlight this. Maybe some people can speak to this experience if they want to share this with me. Thank you. Um, so I don't know if you've been able to make a lot of art during COVID. I've been sort of up and down. I know some people who um, making art every day really help them heal and cope, which is awesome. For me, I kind of had a creative block. So I've been making art in sort of different waves. So sometimes I have really great creative waves and other times I'm just binge watching Netflix or something for a few days before I can get my head around anything. And I've also not made anything that's been directly responsive. It's been more of an escape. So I'm showing you this piece that emerged and it's actually made of the cast offs from an earlier print I made around uh, the holidays. I, I often make my Christmas gifts to my family because I have a huge family and I'm a printmaker, so why not? And um, I made a print of my dog and I printed all sorts of um, dogs on different papers and I had made a completely different print, but I was left with these cast offs. So I made this print here. Um, it's actually more of a collage, I guess, in that case. So this was one of my COVID pieces here and it's called Sleeping Dogs Compounded because it's a bunch of dogs lying on top of each other. And it was just, it was actually just really nice to focus on it. And I've discovered over COVID that my dog has been <laughs> a source of both comfort and inspiration in my art. So I had a lot of cast offs of these cut out dogs. And I actually also made a bigger one down here. And this one is called Sleeping Dogs Lying. Um, and this one actually made it into an online show. So that felt pretty validating. Um, I'll show you some other work here. This is a series that was made by uh, one of the members here at the collective named Micah. And it, these are the offcuts. So um, she did actually a pretty big edition and these were just sort of the ones that she had that were extra or uh, that she wanted to share. Um, this is an older work here by Shannon Moina. And this is um, actually a relief print. And I hope that you can see the amazing details. So she carved this skull and printed it on this beautiful Japanese paper, but she also carved a few bees and she printed them in very translucent ink so that actually you can only see the bees buzzing around this skull if you're looking at it from certain angles. So I thought that was pretty cool. Here's an experiment up here with um, 
the snail that another member named Amy St. John made, and she's also great for just experimenting with collaging effects and printmaking. Another uh, extra print by Micah down here. I recently put some older works up here. Hopefully they are safe for work. <laughs> they are moody nudes, but this really sort of showcases um, how feminism often um, is an important lens in my work. And so these are older works from maybe five years ago and they're called Moody Nudes because the colors of the prints, including the backgrounds, are all informed by mood rings and it's sort of a commentary about the way that gendered bodies get red according to color. So I'm gonna uh, end this wall here with this piece. This was actually one of the first pieces I made during COVID. And it was a response to an online call. And this was actually a piece that was made in my home. I used um, silkscreen monoprint styles because that's something that's very non-toxic and easy to do. And the background is actually a photage effect. So I took uh, wax crayons water that were water-based and I took my silkscreen and I put it down on different surfaces of my house. So over here, this bottom here, that's actually the tile of my bathroom. And up here is actually this, um, this pot holder that I had that was braided in this cool way. So I just, um, uh, I did the frittage effect. Thank you. Now uh, for the background, and this is called Artist in Zoom. This was for um, a show with Gallery 1313, and they wanted COVID portraits, and I thought, well, at this point, I'm on Zoom all the time or any other sort of virtual video communication. Um, and, and I felt like this is the face that I was constantly making that I could see of myself when I was doing it. So I also actually cut out the glasses and behind it that is um, Japanese paper. So I like to, I, I'm a printmaker and I do often do traditional prints, but I also like to collage my different pieces. So sometimes I don't make an addition, but the print I use the printmaking process to make one work. So I'm going to take you now through our studio. So you can see we recently added these shelves. So it's really a community space. As I said, five of us share it, but we don't have different work areas. We just sort of work out a schedule when we're in and we just are really good at sharing the space. So here you can see we have a few things sorted out. Here's our squeegees. We have lots of them. Let me show you my favorite one. I still haven't found um, a work uh, to work on that I would need a squeegee this size, but I can't even fit it in my screen. Oh my goodness. I love this guy. So that's our squeegee collection there for silk screening. You know, we're pretty social in here, so if you come over, we'll probably offer you some coffee and tea. Some of our community paper bins. We are also able to stretch wooden screens here, um, and we often make our own screens if we're doing a really large community project. So we have um, our own mesh. This is one of our drying racks. And some of the spots where our um, screens sometimes live. So these guys are just waiting for me to not be lazy and wash them out so we can use them again. And then here's sort of a back view of our exhibition area slash workshop area slash work area. So we do keep this wall in pretty good condition. And when we work here, we move back quite a bit from the wall so that no art gets damaged. But we do um, have these folding tables that we'll pull out and we'll work on various projects. And um, here's our wall here, our air conditioner in case you're interested. And we actually, um, if you are walking on Wade Avenue and you see our window, we actually put up these shelves by our windows and you'll often see our silk screens uh, waiting to be um, used or drying. So this is actually a print I'm working on right now that I'm hoping I will finish sometime this century. <laughs> Um, this is our washout sink and our washout area, so we try to really be careful with the separation of our chemicals. Um, so we try as much as we can to be a non-toxic studio, but with some printmaking processes you can't totally avoid it, but we do our best and so we're pretty careful about um, separating them. So you see our chemicals are down here. We have our water bottles, all our stations, our soaps and everything. 
first aid kit, safety first. Um, I'm just gonna take you over to this little guy here because when we started, our very first event was a fundraiser because we thought, well, we need equipment. We need something to work off of. And in 2009, we raised enough money to buy something. Not, it wasn't enough for us to get started on renting a studio, but we were able to purchase this baby Jack press. So it's a Jack Richardson press. It's great for relief, collagraph, um, intaglio processes. We don't keep acid in the studio, so we would probably just do dry point if we were doing um, intaglio in here. But it's a great little guy. It's, it's done his job for the last uh, 10 or so years and it's super portable. So we just take the bed out and we're able to lift it. So we've actually brought this to different events when we have been able. Um, and this, this press is as old as this collective. So it has a special place in our heart. Here is another exhibition wall. So when you enter the space, here's our door. And I'm gonna now walk as if I'm entering the space and we have another exhibition wall here where we have some of our work. This is a piece here that I made at an artist residency in Portugal um, and that is cork paper and I used uh, printed on Japanese paper and made the 3D flowers and this was sort of my spin um, on the artist, the Portuguese artist Joana Vasconcelos who does like these really amazing installations that I don't hold the candle to but I had fun trying. So this is sort of like our little welcome area. And actually I would really love to show you guys some of these books because these books were made from Imprint's first project in the studio space called Poetry in Print. This was um, our artist residency that we got funding for. So we were able to invite um, eight local poets to pair with eight local artists, including members of Imprint. And we created uh, brand new bookwork. So they were written, drawn, hand printed, hand bound in editions of 53. And the framework for this project was decolonialism and intersectional feminism. So we didn't necessarily all write about those things, but our framework was from this perspective, like whose voices get heard and why, what stories do we hear and how does artwork really frame that? So um, this is one that I made with Arma Malik, who wrote a beautiful poem. And just so that you see here, um, the, these lines here, this is actually our hair. So for her poem, um, I thought a lot about the concept of electricity and how it's embodied in the body. And I photocopied our hair and printed it. And this is a really beautiful poem. And actually this layer here, you can't see it, but there's a glow-in-the-dark hair layer. So if you took this book home and you turned off the lights, that layer would only show up in the dark, which is pretty cool. So we have a number of really cool books here. Everyone did such a good job, and these are still available for sale um, at our studio or on our website. So if you want to visit, feel free. So that's Poetry in Print. So I take you through what um, the space. We don't really print t-shirts here, we're not set up for it, but we do sometimes uh, like to upcycle clothing and um, we will print on it. This one was handmade completely by artist member Amy. And so this, this was cloth that she bought and she sewed and she printed these flowers on. So this is an infinity scarf, but the rest of them are um, upcycled t-shirts that have been printed. So they're really, they're sort of one of the kinds. So we don't really get into sizing. It's just whatever shirts we find, we print on them and they're almost one of a kind t-shirts, but we don't do textile printing um, in the large scale. So this is the other half of our studio space. I'm just gonna walk back a bit so you can get a sense of it. Um, over there, you see some cyanotype. So cyanotype has been a recent sort of development in the studio. Uh, at least three of the our, our artists are pretty active in it and we've been uh, able to uh, manipulate our dark room, which I'll show you in a bit, to create a really cool um, space also for cyanotype. So you can see some experiments here. So all these works are by Angela Fidel and she's experimenting with different chemicals and we have them up on the wall and you can see how amazing this process really is. So it's like the perfect marriage between photography and um, printmaking. So this has been a really cool thing that's been happening in our space and she's working on some large scale 
playing with different chemicals here. And this is also where our inks get stored. You're going to see a lot of speedball here. I'm going to be full disclosure here. I'm also a speedball um, demo artist, so I love their products. And um, we use a lot of them in the studio. And they're great because they allow us to be as um, non-toxic as possible in our space. So this is our ink wall. This, this area here is all silk screen inks. And then up here we have relief and litho. And I'm going to turn over and show you our litho press. So this is not up and running yet. It's, it's functional, it works, but um, we just need to invest a little bit more time and money into it. So we decided that we did not have the space or the functionality in here to safely do stone litho. So we've been researching other options. Um, and so right now, uh, we one thing that we need to get is like a really thick sort of booster bed so that um, when we use small plates, that it actually reaches the scraper bar here. Most of you, if you're not printmakers, may not know what I'm talking about, but I'm gonna show you here. So it's a lot different than that baby press that I showed you because this is, is a different mechanism here. And this was a press that I got for free. <laughs> so that's a big deal. If I bought, this is a Praga press. If I bought this brand new, it would probably cost me about $20,000. And I just had to pay the cost of the movers. It was disassembled. A school was throwing out their presses and this was missing its press bed. So I just bought um, a new bed. It's made of steel. Um, I wasn't able to get the handle on, so I just used these vice grips, but this press actually works and we're going to be spending the next year or so really sort of getting it up and running. And so I can show you some things that we're playing with. We've got pronto plates. So this is a pronto plate sample. It's made of polyester, so it really mimics the qualities of lithography. So this is just some fun playing with it and it's just this sheet. Um, and we're working on other fun processes that involve this press. So again, disclosure, when I was in art school, my favorite printmaking was lithography. So for me, I have a personal investment in um, getting this press up and running. And we initially didn't have extra funds to get it refurbished. So I paid for that. And I figure in the great tradition of um, patrons in art spaces, I named the press after myself. So this is Big Mo. I'll be Little Mo for now because I don't, I don't think that I can hold a, a light to a candle to a press that weighs a thousand pounds. So this guy will not be moving anytime soon. So you may have also noticed the wall behind the press. We actually just recently uh, reconfigured it. So we're calling this our community wall for now. It may change simply because when the press is running, I'm not sure how safe any art will be on that, but this is just a small collection of posters that we've collected in our time. So one of them is actually a poster for poetry in print, but a few of them are from Ways Goose, which is a book arts festival that we participate in as often as we can in Grimsby. It happens in April. And then a few artists that we have um, had tables nearby. So a few of these artists are local. You might see that we are, we were there, we are here, we are in the future poster. That's a recent purchase in support of black women printmakers who are located in the States and they're a nonprofit of amazing printmakers that I suggest you take out, um, check out. Um, and this was a poster that they produced to help fundraise for their nonprofit. So a lot of really great artists um, that we would love to co connect with and we've collected their work when we've had uh, the opportunity to share spaces at art markets with them. So I'm going to show you quickly the last remaining spaces and if anybody wants to ask any questions please feel free. So this is sort of um, our admini space but also our book binding space and our sewing space. So we also uh, as you saw with poetry and print we make books here mostly paper covers, soft covers, but we do a little bit of hardcover binding as well. And so the, this is our supplies here and our handy dandy sewing machine for when we need to use it. And it's just a great space when I'm working on grants or things like that uh, to come and hang out. Here are some of our flat files. And now I'm gonna show you my messy shelf. Actually, first I'm gonna show you our, our library. So one of the things that's great, if you remember this collective is that we collect books on techniques, on theories, on social issues. So there's a lot of really great resources in this space. And we also 
recently put in these shelves, which have been very helpful. These shelves host our many, many silk screens, which is pretty cool. Um, and then we also have um, these shelves that allow us as the artists who live in this space to hold our things. I'm gonna be very embarrassing right now. This is mine. I have so many things. One of my, my tasks during lockdown was to pull everything out and put everything in a neat way. And you can see I have not done it. I have absolutely not done it. It is a pigsty in there and I swear I'm gonna get to it, but right now it's just holding a bunch of stuff. So mine is actually, you can probably see, mine is the messiest. Our aprons hang out here too. And then we have another administrative space here. Oh, I just wanna show you some, some fun things here. So this was a project that I did with um, six and seven year olds for summer camp. And we were just doing a quick collagraph project. So I had them design their ideal pizza slice and then we printed it so that we had a group pizza pie. And then because it was a group project, it wasn't something that they could take home. They, they printed their own pizzas to take home, but we only did one version of this. And I didn't have the heart to throw it out because I thought it was super cute. So I took it to the studio and I framed it. So now it lives in our admin area. And actually, as you can see, our space is filled with our community projects that we've done. We've worked with a lot of different groups. So here you're looking at some murals from um, past projects in 2016 and 2017 where we um, rented out a space before we had our own and we invited local community groups to come in and create a fabric print mural to uh, sort of reflect on what it was like to live in their neighborhood. So we do a lot of fun things like that. I'm trying to think of a not awkward transition out of this space. Hopefully nobody um, got sick there for a minute. And I just want to also show you our dark room, which is one of the crown jewels of this space. So you'll notice that the light is different and it's because it has a safe light. And this is where we expose our screens. This is where we expose our cyanotypes. This is where we coat our screens and where they live. So you can see we've got like a little splash wall there. We've got some um, off cuts there. And this is our light table. Very, very precious to us. It's actually very hard to find a light table to purchase in Toronto. Um, and again, I found this on Craigslist, but there are instructions you can find if you have an electrician in your life, you can actually get the supplies individually and you can make one yourself but I do recommend doing it under the supervision of an electrician. So this is our dark room and we keep a few other supplies here so you can see that we have um, a few different templates from screens that we've shot either for ourselves or for other people. This one right here is actually for an Arts Etobicoke Arts in the Park event that I did last year, I think. Yeah, and a few of our supplies here, another table, and that's our space. So I hope you guys enjoyed it. It's a really beautiful space. Um, I'm going to take you around the corner here. You can sort of get a sense of it. Um, it's changed so much in even just the two years that we have been here so far. And it's, I can't, I can't overestimate how important it was to feel like I had a space. Like I was lucky that the house that I live in, you know, for a while I could make it work at home, I could make a, I had a small studio and I could produce small works, but really having access not just to a space this big, which would allow me to make bigger works, but also allow me to invite other people in uh, with masks on these days um, to create work together and just to con support each other and consult on things. So this has been, it's, it's been a privilege to be here and I, I'm really grateful that we could have this space. So I'm wondering if anybody has any questions while I walk around. As you look at our retail space. During COVID, we do actually have a number of um, protocols that we decided to put in, spa in, the pla in place. And part of that was inspired by the fact that we were actually really hustling quite hard to pay rent in this wonderful space. Thank you, Ekshada. Um, so we kind of felt like we wanted to make work. Oh, those are some of our big screens. I have a few ideas for a grant project to use those. So hopefully in a year or so, you'll be seeing us bust those out. 
Um, and I kind of forget what I was <laughs> going with my last comment, but um, just that it's really important to be in a community space. Oh yes, COVID protocols. So we have rules about how many people can be in here at one time. Um, we have been, not been really do, we have not really been doing um, as many workshops. We have one in September, but the one that we're doing is a guest artist and can be moved online if required. But we have been doing private rentals. So it's just if we do private rentals, we make sure that nobody else is in the space um, besides a gallery monitor and we're wearing masks and we've got all the appropriate sanitation equipment as needed. What do you sell in your retail space? Oh, we sell original art. We have a lot of cards so people can come and flip through um, the different prints that we make. Um, we're also book binders. So you can see here, this is a Coptic book I made a while ago and it's made of wood. Um, I love to make um, hardcover books and I usually specifically make um, them so that they're sketchbooks for artists. So I do a lot of exposed bindings because it allows you to open the book and lie it flat without cracking the spine. Um, so we sell sketchbooks, we sell zines, we sell cards. These are cards made by member Micah. Some really fun um, non-denominational cards. Um, some zines over here. Sometimes we work on collaborative uh, prints. So we call this, um, this is like in the style of the exquisite corpse game of the 1930s at Surrealist Play where somebody would lay down an image and the next person would lay something down next to it not knowing what the previous thing was. Um, we don't quite play it faithfully but we do these collaborations and they help support our collective when we sell them. And then we have these prints here. Mm -hmm. Thanks to all the people saying that they love the space. I, I love it too, and I'm glad to share it with you. We also have, we're also selling these books as well. So if you love poetry, feel free to come in. These, um, these one, this one's actually a cyanotype cover. So that's pretty neat. It has a blackout poem in it. So the, the, this has been one of the favorite projects that I've ever worked on with InPrint. So much came out of it. I met so many incredible poets and artists. Um, I turned some of them into printmakers who had not been printmakers before, so I feel really good about that. <laughs> if I could convince everybody to be a printmaker, I would. Do we host artist residencies or exhibitions? Um, before COVID, absolutely. So um, our first artist residency was Poetry in Print, um, and I was pretty proud of that because that was one that we were able to get funding for, meaning um, people got paid to be part of our artist residency rather than the other way around. Right now, we offer private lessons and people who are familiar with the space can um, uh, rent the space to work out of at, for day rates. So we're sort of leaving it at that for now. And um, exhibitions, we have stopped putting out calls for now just because um, we're not sure that we could really, with, with our limited capacities as a very small grassroots nonprofit, that we could host them um, successfully in person, but we are working towards, we're spending a lot of time in the next few months working on our online presence and seeing what we can do with that. How do you buy? So you can visit our website, imprintcollective.com, and there are links to our Shopify and our Etsy. I'm not sure if we're going to keep our Shopify uh, for now, just, um, just because uh, we've just got to be smart about how we are functioning financially, but um, our Etsy will be up for a while and people can also directly call us or me and I will have, I'm happy to help you buy art. <laughs> um, is there anything else that anybody's interested in knowing about or hearing? I just keep moving the camera around because I'm in love with the space and I want you to be in love with it too. We've got these great high ceilings during the day, especially when it's sunny like this, you almost don't even need the lights on and we got all this beautiful light coming in. So it's a wonderful place to join. Yeah, so maybe I'll show you some stuff that I'm doing here, some books for the people who are asking what we sell, some hardcover books that I'm working on. This is a soft cover and I just did it because I messed up the template, so I thought, let me practice my Coptic binding and I just turned it into a soft cover. Um, so I'm, I'm not selling this because this was just a test book and I had made mistakes, but um, I used really good Canson paper, so I'm gonna use it as a journal for myself 
And then I am actually in the process, so I did some French sewing here. I'm in the process of turning these into hardcover books, so you'll see that on our website um, shortly. And I've got these new inks. There's these specialty inks, beautiful colors, and they just make me drool. So I'll show you some of them. This is electric pink in a relief ink and I'm just like oh my goodness I need to figure out what project I'm going to do so that I can play with these um, amazing inks. So these are like special edition um, inks that Speedball just put out and they were designed with artists so oh yeah I have a thing for pink. Um, we don't currently have resources for metal etching. Uh, it's something we'd love to do. I def definitely took intaglio when I was in art school and I kept it up for a little bit afterwards, but I had found that the materials actually made me sick. So um, there's a lot of toxic materials that are involved in printmaking. Maybe I'll just focus this conversation on some of the artwork. So there's a lot of toxic materials and so I'm always on the hunt for um, non-toxic materials and there is a form of metal etch that is called salt tables uh not table salt but salt etching and i know some printmakers in cambridge who do it successfully so that's something in the future we would definitely be interested in because um it doesn't actually involve acid it would it involves a mixture of um chlorine and um, salt, table salt and water. So we're gonna look at that. Aqua tint would be awesome. I wouldn't do it with resin, um, mostly because, maybe I'll flip this back to me. Mostly because with resin, um, it again, that's a super um, toxic material to work with. Um, but when I was in art school, we actually used screen filler and an air gun. And that was an amazing process. So that would be something I would also be interested in investing in and investigating further for the studio. It's just sort of also configuring our space because we're only about 700 square feet and there are already five of us and we are looking for a sixth. Um, so we're just thinking about space and how we use up that space. But yeah, I'm happy to experiment. I'm pretty, I feel like I have my hands full with silkscreen and relief and bookbinding and my future experiments with um, litho. I'm very interested in um, uh, exploring Mokulidu, and that's, that's gonna be a post-COVID exploration. So I have to take workshops to learn that, and so far I don't know anybody in Canada who offers them, so I will have to travel abroad. Oh, boo-hoo boo for me. But, um, you know, it's still just even nice to think about having a space where I could even experiment. and. You know, if my experiments are successful, you can bet that I will be showing absolutely everybody how to do it. Okay, so if there are no further questions, I feel like I've been talking a long time and hopefully most of you have been able to sit through me yammering about my love of print and the studio, I will say goodbye. And thank you for visiting. Um, and again, um, my contact information for both myself and for InPrint is pinned at the bottom here. So feel free to throw us a line. We'd love to hear from you, uh, whether you're a new printmaker or an old printmaker who's just looking to print in a new space or experiment. We'd love to hear from you. Thank you.